Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity to give this mini course. So I will talk about these two objects. So injective metric spaces and heligraphs, which are sort of injective metric spaces with a cell structure on it. So I will start by uh, giving some references. So there's a beautiful article by Urs Lang, which is called Injective an absolute one Lipschitz retract. If for every isometric embedding of X into a metric space Y, isometric embedding, there exists a one Lipschitz retract onto its image from R to the image of the embedding. Okay. So three a priori completely different definitions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, does cat zero imply Heli? No. For the Coxter 333 three group is cat zero, but not Heli. I think by automatic open. Yeah. And, but it's open whether every Heli group is cat zero. So now I will take the most reassuring thing up after seeing three different definitions. X hyperconvex is equivalent to X injective. It's also equivalent to X being an absolute one Lipschitz retract. And so one may choose a name among those. And since Oslong is one of the first to have used injective metric spaces in the setting of geometric group theory, I will rather use injective metric spaces, even though it's, I thought it's a choice. Making, making a, they don't have any definition, not definition things of this. Maybe I'm not so French at all. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, so it's great because we have we we see that we have a very interesting object if we have many equivalent simple definitions, right? And in practice, checking hyperconvexity is somewhat simpler. Checking intersection of balls. And these property are of uh, injectivity and absolute one inches retract are a bit more advanced and not so obvious. So before giving a proof of this, I will give you some examples of such spaces so that you can see what we're dealing with. Okay, so the easiest example is R, the real line, is injective. So I will actually give a proof that it is injective, but Checking hyperconvexity is in fact simple. You just have to check that intervals in R satisfy the Heli properties, not hard to, to check. Um, another simple example is R2 with the L2 metric, the Euclidean space. It is not injective. So why is that? Because you can easily draw, if you're careful enough, three pairwise intersecting balls that we do not globally intersect, right? Uh, maybe it's the first example you have in mind when you think about three pairwise intersecting balls. Well, in Euclidean space, they do not globally intersect. Uh, what happens if you take R2 with the L infinity norm? It is injective. I will also give a formal proof of that, but what's the difference between L2 and L infinity? You pass from disks to squares and for squares, this property is more convincing, right? Here, you do have an intersection. It's just a picture. I will give you an actual proof of this later. What do you think about R2 with the L1 metric? Is it injective or not? It's the same, yes. It's isometric to R2 L infinity. It is injective. Okay, good. Um, in fact, Rn with the L infinity norm is injective and it is the only injective norm on Rn. So injective metric spaces are really L infinity geometry, piecewise L infinity spaces. So if you're an analyst, this should scare you because every theorem is usually for LP when P is, is a finite number, but 
well, an infinity is a lot of fun. Okay. Uh, what are non-flat examples where we have complete arteries or say trees, simplicial trees, if you wish, are injective. We will also see a, a proof of this. And another class of example come from cardio cube complexes. So if you take any finite dimensional cardio cube complex, well, they, they have the name cardio cube complex because you often wish to put the piecewise L2 Euclidean metric on each cube. If you do put on each cube the piecewise L1 metric, you would get an inject, uh, median metric space, as you saw uh, in the lecture from Ilya. But now if you put the piecewise L infinity metric, piecewise L infinity metric is injective. Those are just a few examples to see what kind of spaces we can look at. And of, of course, we can also do L infinity products. So let me just start by giving a formal proof that R is injective, not hyperconvex, but really injective uh, with this definition about uh, the existence of extension. Well, maybe I will leave it. Yeah. Yes, with some assumptions. Uh, I will mention it later. If you have a median space of finite rank, maybe some properness assumption, you, you can change the metric so that it becomes injective. So it's median spaces are a part of the injective space theory. Of course, with the injective with median spaces, you can do much more, but they're also more restricted in terms of groups. Well, um, you have to be careful about topology if you have infinite dimensional cubes. Well, 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 it's only locally finite dimensional is enough. But the first proposition is that R is injective. So why is that? Uh, well, we'll do the proof. Let's start with a function from A to R, and we want to uh, one fits, and we want to extend it to a function from B to R. Well, what can we do? Well, we can actually find the least uh, one Lipschitz extension of it. It's uh, f bar from b to r, which to b maps the supremum over all a of f of a minus the distance between a and b. Uh, is I think it's the least one Lipschitz extension of f. So you can check the, the detail, but it's, uh, it's quite explicit. And I will now see why Rn with the L infinity norm is also injective. Any questions so far? Uh, why did I define it? B because I, sometimes I want to talk about this property of uh, intersection of balls. And sometimes we may wish to say that the space is three hyperconvex or four hyperconvex if I know that three pairwise intersecting balls have this property. What? Yeah? Does this theorem for variance apply in general? Being? Yeah, geodesic. Yes, we will see that. Every injective matrix space is geodesic. Any other questions? Yeah? So it may be still better like a one assuming by leads. Uh, among all one if it's extensions, this is the minimal one. I think point wise. Uh, okay. Uh, medium space if you change it to metric. Yes. Yeah. But aren't, I mean, aren't already three hyperconvex? Or... Uh, it, it's already three hyperconvex, but it's not enough. To, it's essentially, injectivity is equivalent to being four hyperconvex, okay. roughly speaking. Okay. So if I will take, in fact, not only Rn with the L infinity norm, but any uh, space of bounded function. It is injective. So let's start with a function from A to L infinity to X, which is one Lipschitz. I want to extend it to a one Lipschitz function from B to, to, to L infinity of X. So for each X, I have the function FX from A to R. 
and I just prove that R is injective. So I can take a one Lipschitz extension, F X bar from B to R, a one Lipschitz extension. Okay, and we just have to check that this works. And uh, so you also have to check that this defines a bounded function, but it is true. And F bar from B to R is bounded, uh, sorry, from, from N to N infinity of X R is well defined and is a one Lipschitz extension. Okay, I, I leave the details as an exercise, but it's, you see, it's quite simple. Okay, so in particular, we see that it works for Rn when X is an endpoint space. Now we will see some properties of, uh, of those spaces. Well, you mentioned that uh, you asked the question whether every injective space is geodesic, and the answer is yes, and it's obvious. If you take the right definition of injective, any injective space is geodesic. So how can we see that? Well, if we take any two points in X, I will call R the distance between X and Y. I will look at the space A consisting of two points, zero and R, uh, the map F, which sends zero to X and R to Y. This asymmetric space, when these two points are distance R, is one Lipschitz. It's even an isometric embedding. And since X is injective, it extends to B, which is the full interval, which is one Lipschitz extension. And since R is precisely the distance between X and Y. This is actually an isometric embedding. Okay, so geodesicity is an immediate consequence from injectivity, but not from the other ones. Um, but it's not uniquely geodesic because L infinity is famously not a uniquely geodesic space. So it's kind of the interest of a theory. You have to find nice way to choose geodesics. So we will see that in the next lectures, but it's all part of the fun. So what other very general properties just follow from the definition? It's a uh, completeness. And now completeness follow, follows easily from the absolute one Lipschitz retract, retract property. So I will prove it. Any absolute one Lipschitz retract. Yeah. You said it's not uniquely geodesic. Actually, we have a recipe for uh, choosing the best ones. There are several recipes. So there's one by Urslang. So for any injective metric space, there's one recipe, which is rather good. It's conical, not unique, equivalent under isometries. But Long also proved that if you had some more properties like properness and finite dimensionality, there's Actually, a unique best uh, by combi. How do you define best? Like well, you cannot hope for more. Uh, it's unique. It's convex. It's consistent. It's almost as good as cat zero spaces. But would it be that as well associated with this extension property? Uh, no. Uh, no. 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 Because even that, this is really not unique. And even producing one choice of geodesic that is equivalent under the isometry group is non-trivial. Uh, any other questions? Okay, so I was about to prove that uh, absolute one Lipschitz retract implies completeness. Well, I can consider the metric completion of X, X bar. And since X is a one Lipschitz absolute one Lipschitz retract, it means that whenever I embed my space isometrically, I can retract. So there exists a one Lipschitz retract R from X bar to the image of X. But now I know that 
i of x inside x bar is dense. So it means that x bar is actually isometric to i of x, which is isometric to x, which is complete. OK, now that we've seen some examples on how properties work, uh, we will now get to the proof of the theorem that all three properties are equivalent. Okay, so we will start with um, the first one. Injectivity implies hyperconvexity. First one, hyperconvexity. Sorry, in injectivity implies hyperconvexity. I wanted to do it this way. So I know my space is injective and I want to prove hyperconvexity. So hyperconvexity is whenever I fix a bunch of points and a bunch of radii, I want to see that the balls intersect. So I consider such points and radii. And now I will use injectivity, which is whenever I have a one Lipschitz map from A to X, I can one Lipschitz extend it. So my space A will be simply the set of all points Xi in I as a subspace of X. And now I will include this in the metric space B, which is A union a point Y, where I declare the distance between X and Y to be between X I and Y to be R I. It is a metric space. The definition, the property of the air eyes ensure the triangle inequality. And now I have a one Lipschitz extension from B to X, one Lipschitz extension. And I just have to look at the image of Y, F bar of Y is in the intersection of all balls. Okay, this one was easy. Uh, now I will look at the next one from hyperconvexity to one Lipschitz ret retraction, absolute one Lipschitz retract. So now I have to start with some isometric embedding, metric embedding, where X is assumed to be hyperconvex. And I want to find a one Lipschitz retraction from Y to the image of this embedding. So now, of course, I will use uh, Zorn's lemma and the axiom of choice. Uh, so assume that Z is a subset of Y, which is maximal, such that there exists a one Lipschitz retract from Z with the image of X. So there, there are other constructive proofs, but I, I find this one easier to, to see. We will see that if Z is not Y, we can always find one Lipschitz retraction on a larger subset than Z. If Z is not Y, I will consider a point Y, which is not in Z. And I want to find an, an extension of R to Z with that extra point Y. So what will I do? I will let consider a point Y bar, which is in the intersection of all points in Z of the ball centered at the retraction of Z and the radius being the distance between Z and Y. So since R is one Lipschitz, these balls satisfy the property in the definition of hyperconvexity. So they have a global intersection in X because X is assumed to be hyperconvex. And now I can consider R bar from Z union Y to I of X which sends uh, Z to R of Z and Y to Y bar. It is a larger retract. So it contradicts the maximality of this retract. I can always find a retraction on a 
larger subset. And now the last one being absolute one Ipschitz retract implies injectivity. So absolute one Ipschitz retract implies injectivity. So if I start with a space which is a one absolute one Ipschitz retract, I want to show that it's injective. So I want to start with a map f from a to x, which is one Lipschitz. And a is included in b, and I want to extend f to b. So, uh, sorry, that's not, not how I start my proof. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so, in fact, I will consider, an, so I start with x, which is an absolute one Lipschitz retract. And now I look at uh, the space Y, which is the space of all bounded function from X to R with this submetric. It is actually injective. We proved it. And now I will define an embedding of X into Y, the Kuratowski embedding. So Y from X to Y, which sends any point to its distance function the distance to X minus the distance to a base point. So this, uh, so this is an isometric embedding. It's called the Kuratowski embedding. It's quite a useful property to embed a metric space into a space of functions. And now I can use the one Lipschitz, absolute one Lipschitz retract property to find a retract from Y to the image of X, one Lipschitz retract. But now Y is injective and I of X is a one Lipschitz retract of an injective space. And it's quite easy to see that it implies that the image, the space I of X is injective. You just have to compose the extension. This implies that I of X, which is isometric to X, is Injective. Okay, we have three very nice properties and they are all equivalent. Any questions so far? So now I will give a definition of heligraphs, which um, it's funny, follow a very similar pattern that injective metric spaces. And there's a rich interplay between injective metric spaces and heligraphs that I'm trying to, to emphasize. So I will now give the definition of a heligraph. So before that, I will fix some notation for me, a graph. I will think of the graph as just its vertex set, the combinatorial distance. The distance between two vertices is the length of the shortest path, okay? And now with this definition, the connected graph, also denoted X is heli. If you have the same property for balls, if pairwise intersecting balls, balls have a global intersection, I emphasize that it's balls in the vertex set. Okay, it's not in the geometric realization of a of the graph. And you may wonder why choose this definition. Well, you can also do the same with other definition. X is heli if and only if, uh, so you can also talk about replace in the definition of hyperconvex everything with integers rather than reals. So I will say that X is integrally hyperconvex. It's also equivalent to X being um, uh, integrally injective, meaning that for any uh, isometric embedding of a space with integer valued matrix inside it, I can one Lipschitz extend it to a larger space B. And it's also equivalent to X being integrally absolute one Lipschitz retract. 
So really, you should think of injective metric spaces and heligraphs are as injective objects in a category of metric spaces with distance in Z or R, with morphisms being one inch maps. From this point of view, they're essentially the same object. And what are examples of such graphs? Mm -hmm. if, if you take one set of if you take the morphism to be something like uh, instead of one metric mass, uh, you take them to be something else, is it possible that it would recover the, the L and this thing kind of be complex? Or... I have no idea. Uh, it's true that in median spaces have some form of universal properties, like there's a universal median space, universal medial algebra, but I'm not sure how this relates to this point. Of view. What are very simple examples of heligraphs? Well, we can take discrete versions of the graphs we had before. So if you take, for instance, the infinite line, well, it's easy to see that both are intervals and they do satisfy the heli property. It's not hard to be convinced of it. You can also look at complete graphs. So for instance, the complete graph on four vertices is a heligraph. Well, every ball is either just one vertex of, or everything. What's the simple, simplest example of a graph which is not heli? It's the square. It's not heli. So how to see that? Well, if you look at, at the, the balls, here's the one ball centered at this vertex. And here we have this. It's a one ball centered at this vertex. Here we have this as a one ball and here this as a one ball. The pair was intersect, but not globally. Um, so what happens if you want to find a graph which on which Z2 will act? Uh, so if we want to find, if you try to do the standard square grid, it will not work because just of this obstruction. But if you add diagonals, it will work. And in this picture, there is no vertex in the middle of squares, just extra edges. So this one is a heligraph, either a finite or infinite version. And you may wonder, well, what about other nice tilings of R2? Uh, one of your favorite tilings should be the A2 tilde tiling. What about the L2 tilde tiling? Of R2, it's a tiling by equilateral triangles. And now, is it heli or not? What do you think? Seven yeah, <laughs> good. Okay, so if I take the one ball centered at that vertex, I get this. If I take the one ball centered at that vertex, I get this. And if I take the vertex centered, oh, wait, did I? Oh, yeah, here. Yes, here. Okay, so we see that three balls of radius one pairwise intersect, but not globally. So this A to tilde tiling is not heli. And this is a source. So the isometry, the automorphism group of this tiling is cat zero, but not heli. Uh, this is due to Hoda. Okay, nice examples. Uh, so trees, of course, trees are heli. And also, if you take the thickenings of a cat zero cube complex is heli. So what is the thickening? Well, um, so if I start with the cat zero cube complex, say X, so the thickening, it's a graph, I will say Y, such that the vertex set of Y is the same as the vertex set of X, but I will add an edge between X and Y, if and only if X and Y are in a cube of X. So what does it look like? If I draw just part of a card zero cube complex, well, uh, I will add edges here, like here, like diagonals. 
And inside the three cube, I will add all possible edges. So it will be a mess. It's why it's called a thickening. It's a standard way to produce uh, heligraphs where cells have nice convexity properties. Yes? No, it's even worse. So if you take the automorphism group of this tiling, and if you take any co-bounded action, proper action on an injective metric space, well, it has no proper co-bounded action on an injective metric space. So there's no hope whatsoever. And here's the proof. You take the asymptotic cone. It's R2 with some norm, which should be invariant on the sigma 3. But it's not, because the only injective norm on R2 is at infinity. Uh, yes, yes, of a finite dimensional. This is to be safe. It's proved in this generality. Maybe you can enlarge it a bit better. Locally finite is certainly fine, but you, well, you should be careful about any cardiac complex, is what I'm saying. Thank you. So, so yeah. can, you, can you tell us the, 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 the reason I think really goes wrong in that example? Like, well, the, 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 well, I mean, I well, the, 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 the idea is roughly the same. If you try to cubulate this group, if you try to cubulate this group, you will have three families of walls yeah. and you take the associated cube complex. It will be R3 with the L1 metric. So you need to add an extra dimension. It's the same. There's a natural object associated to it, which is the injective hole, which will be R3 with the infinity metric. And this can be seen as essentially the, the restriction to a slice of R3. But I can't do better than that for this example. Any other question? Okay. So now I will talk about group actions and I will give you some examples of groups acting on, on such spaces. Well, we have seen in the, in the proof that you can embed any uh, metric space into L infinity, right? By the Kuratowski embedding. So every metric space embeds in an injective metric space. We will make this more precise soon. But so if you're looking at any group acting on the scaly graph, say financial generated group, it will always act properly on an injective metric space. So if we want to say something interesting about a group acting properly on an, on an injective metric space, you should add some restrictions, okay? So either some properness of the space or some finite dimension the assumptions also compoundedness or co compactness. So here are some uh, qualities that you could require for an action. So um, a group G is called uh, coarsely injective. So if you want to be careful, you should add coarsely metrically injective because injective has various meanings, of course, in mathematics. But it's called coarsely injective if it acts properly, co-boundedly, co boundedly on an injective metric space. Okay, so this is coarsely injective. We have injective if it acts co-compactly, properly co-compactly on an injective metric space, which is a bit more to ask. And it will be called heli if it acts uh, properly and co-compactly, heli graph. So these are definitions. So it's clear that being coarsely injective implies being Injective implies being coarsely injective because if you, your action is co-compact, it's certainly co-bounded. So this implication is clear. And in fact, Heli implies injective. So it's a remark. Any Heli group is injective. So this explains why Heli graphs are just a better behaved injective metric spaces. And this is also why they are interesting because you can use tools both from graph, graph theory and from continuous spaces with geodesic bicombings. And after these definitions, of course, uh, I will give later an explanation why this is true. But, but now I will give examples of groups in each place, classes. So, 
So for instance, the easiest examples we have are Z to the N and the free abelian group and the free groups are heli, right? Because Z to the N acts on the thickening of the standard cubical tiling of Rn and Fn acts on its Kelly tree. More generally, it's a consequence of these examples that I mentioned that co-compactly cubulated groups are heavy. Okay. Um, so the result I mentioned before is that hyperbole groups are heavy. This is a very nice and deep result by Lang. I will give some ideas uh, later in the lectures. And also, hyperbolic groups relative to heliparabolics are themselves heli. Uh, very nice family are break groups are heli. This is due to uh, Jing Wang and Dan Yan Ozaida. And more generally, you have um, what are called garside groups, which I will possibly talk about a bit about. And also some artin groups, artin groups of type AFC are also heli. It's a result due to Wang and Ozaida as well. Uh, you have some small constellation groups for, for instance, C4, T4 groups are heli. I think it's in the article by Chalopin, Chepoy, Geneva, Irai, Ozaida. And you have to wait for uh, Nima's second lecture to know what C44 means. Uh, so these are examples of heli groups. Uh, so you may wonder, is there a group which is injective but not heli? Well, there is one, but it's a very subtle one. There exists a lattice gamma in H2 cross a tree, which is injective and not heli. This is due to some Hughes and Martinus valueness. It's not biotomatic, and by heli groups are biotomatic. And I also gave an example of well, of large family of injective groups, uniform lattices in GLNR, and most classical semi-simple groups uh, as well are injective. And it's open whether they are heli or not. Um, if they were heli, it would imply biotomaticity, biotomaticity, which is open for these groups. So it's likely that they are not, because it's hard to find such a discrete structure for uniform lattices, but who knows? Uh, so we, there's at least one example of heli, which is not injective. And there are actually many natural examples of injective groups. And about injective groups, which are cross injective groups, we, which may not be injective. So there are mapping class groups of finite type surfaces, finite type surfaces are coarsely injective. It's a result with a codon, and they're probably not injective. And finally, uh, the simplest of, of a, example of a group which is not coarsely injective is right here. So this automorphism group, so the Coxter group of the triangle 333, which is the natural semi-direct product of sigma 3 and Z2, is not coarsely injective. It's due to Hoda. Okay, so from this list, you see that many, many groups which are geometric in nature have interesting actions on injective metric spaces. When I say interesting, of course, it depends on uh, the flavor you want to put in. Um, and even this group has an interesting action on R3, so it will be proper and finite dimensional. So it's not so far from having an interesting action on an injective metric space. So are there any questions? And not exactly. So 
so there's a, a nice the construction. We will see that next time. For given any graph, you can build a smallest Halley graph containing it. So for instance, if you type with the Kelly graph of any Kelly graph of a hyperbolic group, it's Halley hull will be uh, locally finite at bounded distance. So it's Lang's work. But if you start with any Kelly graph, for instance, if you take the standard Kelly graph of Z2, it will be a standard square grid, which is not Halley. So usually you have to pick specifically a nice graph for it to be Halley. Oh, they are usually not because uh, um, you don't have the, any distortion in injective or Halley groups. And usually when you're non-uniform, you have distortion. It's yes. Yeah. I'm gonna come, I'm gonna come back to the 18 Yeah. So, so you gave a reason, but you said it's not really because it's injected followed by part of the Yeah. But why can't, like, like, why can't you do something like what you did, you put it down the hard drive, down the distance? Like, well, why is that not even possible? Well, you cannot do it equivalently. Yeah. Can you see why, like, is there a, is there a clear reason why that's not possible? Uh, because you, you, would, you would need, uh, uh, symmetry, which is invariant under the sigma three group, and and if you want to find, define a distance which is invariant under the sigma three group, if you look at the asymptoticon, you will actually see it. As a, the asymptoticon of this group is very restricted. Yeah. In the GMR space, yes. The space of like symmetric space with like. A, Yes, that's a very good point. So I will, if I have time, I will give details on it. If not, there's in the notes. So it's it's very subtle. So they are injective, but the metric space they act on is not finite dimensional. So in fact, it's GLN R. You see it inside the space of ellipsoids in Rn, and you look at the space of all convex subset of Rn. This is your injective metric space. So it's infinite dimensional, but the action is, is still co-compact. Oh, this is uh, this is more technical. So you have to essentially mapping class group look like Cadio cube complexes, and you will look at the L infinity metric on Cadio cube complexes, which could be described as looking at one Lipschitz as a contractions, uh, median maps to the interval, and you look at the supremum of all median maps to the interval, and this defines a metric. And most of the work is showing that this metric is weakly geodesic. That's the rough, very rough idea. I will give some details in the median case, not the coarse median case. Yeah. Why do you think the mapping class not Uh so essentially, yes. So uh so there's uh um a result I would very much like to be published by uh uh, by uh, by two two authors that uh, injective uh, when you have a group action on an injective space you should have a splitting result, which should forbid you to have uh, uh, which which for, forbid you to be injective like Brightson's argument that mapping that groups are not cut zero. So the obstruction should be the same. Yeah. Related to the question: If you have a proper co-bounded action on metric metric space. Yeah. Do elements that have positive translation length that want an axis or not, not program back? I, I have no idea. It's for me, it's open. Because, like, like why, isn't, why isn't the metric space like the example that you have with the, the proof that you have with, with the big and with the uh, why isn't that problematic to the big so hard? Like, what, why, you know? You have dangerous, so um, how will they act? And well, the the problem is that may, maybe you will you will find a nice subspace by really finding a splitting. You you need some properness somewhere. Uh, I, I think that's the, the the main idea. It's yeah. But then they used to have that um, Halley property is not a dimensionality invariant. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, on the contrary, it's very rich because it depends on which group you look at. I want to look at nice groups, not monsters. So, do you consider coxing groups to be nice groups? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay.
an emotional support group later on at 5 p.m. Okay. Can't accept this until the uh, So I will attend. So thank you for <laughs> that, that's all for today. Thank you. Yeah, there's a great crowd, and then afterwards, uh, you can just come back here with all your questions from all of the talks, and it will be pretty informal. And we're going to have a final question for the day. I can't hear what you're saying. So everyone can come back with your questions.